The 35 years of the Center for Human Rights can be divided broadly into three phases. The first phase is 1986, when the Center was founded, up to 1999, when Justice van der Vest Hazen stood down as director. During this phase, the Center focused on the constitutional transition in South Africa. The second phase is 2000 to 2007, when Professor Christoph Haynes was director. The third phase is the period after 2007, when the Center has become an academic department. The Center for Human Rights was founded in 1986 as part of domestic efforts against the apartheid regime. Its vision of an equal South Africa, free from oppression and discrimination, drew criticism from some members of the public and attracted the wrath of the government. Established to foster human rights education and awareness, the Center in its early years participated in meetings with the liberation movement outside the borders of South Africa and was an integral part of the drafting process of both the interim and final constitution. The mid-1980s were dark days in the human rights history of South Africa. Um, the end of apartheid was in sight, but for that very reason, the oppression became more and more serious. Uh, there was a state of emergency in place, for example. So, um, in 18, early 1986, some of us in the law faculty decided uh, to have a conference on a Bill of Rights for South Africa. At that stage, it was quite controversial because negotiations had not even started. Uh, some suspected us of trying to prevent white group interests for the future, but we overcame that and had a very, very successful conference. Coincidentally, on the 1st and 2nd of May, that is May Day of, of that year. After the success of the conference, uh, we were wondering what to do now. You know, people in the faculty who did not really believe in human rights at that particular time um, participated in this basically for the sake of the image of the university and the mere fact that it was an exciting project. So when we met afterwards and we asked each other what now, the idea came up that we start a center for human rights. Initially it was called the Center for Human Rights Studies because I wanted it to look at as academic as possible. The initial vision and purpose was resistance against apartheid. We wanted a conservative Afrikaans university to speak out against apartheid and in favor of a f human rights dispensation, constitutionalism, etc. Now thereafter many things of course happened. Um, the center grew and um, especially my successors, uh, Christoph Heinz and Franz Fillion, took it into the rest of Africa. I did some early trips into uh, other African countries, but they came with initiatives like the Southern African and African Moot Court competition and many others. So projects followed the student volunteers, the integrated bar project, etc. As soon as the new South African constitution came into place, we started to present courses on uh, the Bill of Rights, the human rights litigation, etc. So my vision was to a large extent focused on South Africa and apartheid. Thereafter, uh, it became a much bigger project and therefore it is now a very famous center, uh, especially in Africa, but across the world as well. Department of Legal History, where the centre was born under the leadership of Johan van der Listeisen. From there we have grown, still growing, so much so that we are now running out of office space. I have many fond memories, too many to relate in a short space of time. And if there were any not so fond memories, I must have deleted them because. I have 
major jobs for myself at the centre was to organise a conference on de facto discrimination, which was in 1992. And as you can imagine, in 1992, there was no email, there was no Google, there was no internet, there was no cell phones, no WhatsApp, nothing. The only form of communication was telephones and fax machines. So communicating, particularly in Africa, was extremely difficult and very challenging. And we organized an international conference. The second phase in the life of the center from 2000 to 2006 is characterized by a greater outreach to the African continent and by the start of two master's programs that would become the center's flagship programs the Human Rights and Democratization in Africa, HRDA, and International Trade and Investment Law in Africa, TILA. Yeah, so the center has been around for, for 30 years. Um, I think it started from a humble beginning. As far as I know, uh, it was in a parking lot. Uh, the registrar and the one from West Asia had a discussion and said they had to do something about what was happening in the country. This was the time of the state of emergency, the time of apartheid. And in a way, the centre responded to that. Um, and I think that's the underlying idea also that we have in the new court and with our other projects is from human wrongs to human rights. So we look at what is wrong and then we try to solve a particular problem. It's not some abstract notion or some idea that one finds somewhere that you can try. One of the core aims of the centre is to build a cadre of well-educated, committed and competent human rights professionals who can act as agents for social change. We do so through formal education programmes at the master's and doctoral level. In this way, the centre has contributed and is contributing to cultivate African scholarship in the fields of human rights, democracy and the rule of law. Shortly after the adoption of the Interim Constitution in 1994, a first master's program, one in constitutional practice and human rights, was introduced by people who later became center people but at the time worked in the Department of Jurisprudence. That program was later discontinued but in 2000, the first and now the landmark program of the center as such was introduced the Masters in Human Rights and Democratization in Africa. In 2003, the Masters program, the LLM, in International Trade and Investment Law was introduced. After the Centre became an academic department in 2007, it introduced three further programs. The LLM, MPhil in Multidisciplinary Human Rights, introduced in 2009. LLM, MPhil in Sexual and Reproductive Rights in Africa, the SRRA, present in online or hybrid format since 2015. The LLM or MPhil in Disability Rights in Africa, DRIA, presented in collaboration with the Department of Public Law since 2019. Masters in Human Rights and Democratization in Africa started with three main objectives. The first one is to educate those on the continent on human rights issues in Africa and to create a pool of professionals which are working in the field on the issue. 
secondly is to reinforce research on the issues of human rights in Africa and third was to build a network of professionals or of universities on the issues of human rights and democratization in Africa and as of today we have 12 partner universities who offer the masters in human rights and democratization in Africa together with the Center for Human Rights so the first semester which runs from January to July is hosted by the Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria and students are located to the 12 partner universities which are across the continent ranging from the west in University Glasnobergia in Senegal, Addis Ababa University in the east, the University of Western Cape in South Africa. So together with the partner universities, we try to uh, have common research, have discussions on how to make the master's program better. The master's program is also part of the Global Campus of Human Rights, which is a network of about 100 universities across the world. So there are similar master's programs in human rights and democratization, which are being run in seven regions of the program. And we, as the Global Campus Africa, we form part of the Global Campus for Human Rights. The TILA program, the Trade and Investment Law in Africa program, was started in 2003. Um, it was started with funding from the Carnegie Corporation. Um, and one of the conditions of the funding was that we should uh, do the, the program in partnership with the University of the Western Cape, which we were very happy to do. And so it was agreed that uh, we would create one joint program, but it would be conducted each year or in alternate years at the different universities. So since 2003, every second year is at the University of Pretoria and in the other year at the University of the Western Cape. Um, over time, the, the two programs have both continued, but they've uh, changed and grown in different ways. Uh, the program here at uh, uh, University of Pretoria in the Center for Human Rights has um, uh, grown. We've had be been lucky to get funding over the various over the years from uh, the World Bank, um, from APSA Bank, um, and now we have funding uh, for, through a generous donor, um, so that we can afford to fund some of the students uh, with scholarships, and some of the students, some of the South African students, get funding from uh, my chair through the South African Research Chair Initiative at uh, National Research Foundation. In the 17 years that the program has been going, we've had 176 students from 20 African countries and four non-African countries. Uh, that will go up this year, we hope, by another 19 students. So almost 200 students have graduated from the program. One of the signs of that the program is beginning to have a, an impact on um, trade and investment law across the continent is that in the negotiation of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, some of our graduates were in different delegations all participating in the negotiations in the same room. The MDHR program, we go beyond the law and involve other disciplines in human rights education. We use um, methods from political science, we involve the arts in human rights. The program also um, touches on economics where we do issues involving illicit financial flows in Africa. We do law and sustainable development. So we bring in the sustainable development goals and discuss them in relation to human rights and find practical ways that students can be involved in serving SDG challenges on the continent and I think one of the fascinating things about the program is the fact that it draws across a wide array of students who are both lawyers and non-lawyers. It has been an absolute honor and pleasure to do this work and see the journeys of all the students who come into this program and live transformed to use the human rights knowledge acquired and apply in the various fields that they have found themselves. The Masters in Sexual and Reproductive Rights in Africa was started in 2015. It is a program that is aimed at um, responding to a lack of capacity, if you will, or discussions around sexual and reproductive rights in the African continent. 
um, it responds to a gap on an issue that from other regions of the world is a little bit more developed, even though not as sufficiently, but is much more underdeveloped on the African region because um, sexual and reproductive rights have remained largely controversial. The thinking was to establish a group of people on the African continent that can competently advocate, uh, competently research, competently train, and competently guide policy implementation related to sexual and reproductive rights in Africa. So that is when the program was uh, conceptualized. Um, it began with the first group of students in 2015, uh, and it is presented in a, in a blended format. The blended format means that it is partially um, virtual and partially in person. It's the first of the center's programs to have this format. Um, and that has been very uh, important because it has allowed um, participants who would otherwise not be in a position to travel for a period of an entire two years to undertake the program because it is offered over a two year period. Um, so over the course of the two years, the students attend learning or, or continue learning virtually uh, through you know, uh, the tools that are available at University of Victoria, such as ClickUp, the, the, the learning, the Blackboard uh, tool, as well as other in online interactions. Then at least twice a year, they are required to be uh, present in Pretoria. During those periods, which can last, can be about a week or thereabout, could be a little bit more, they, uh, they then have direct or in-person uh, classes, contact classes with the respective lecturers in what are referred to as block weeks. So those block weeks um, for each of the courses, there is a period through which it's offered virtually and a period that the students have to attend uh, contact classes. So the Masters in Sexual and Reproductive Rights is offered uh, with the support, with the financial support of uh, Wellspring Philanthropic uh, Funders as well as um, Open Society Foundation. The SRA program is a master's program that is offered to both law graduates and non-law graduates. So it is these, an LLM and an MPhil. And that is important because sexual reproductive rights issues are generally issues that, that uh, transcend the legal sphere. So most of the time, the people who are the front lines of uh, protecting Section of reproductive rights may not necessarily be lawyers. And so it has been important for us to be able to bridge that divide and to, um, to, ex to spend the expertise beyond uh, the legal field. The starting idea of the master's program in disability rights in Africa was that it was a response to a need that arose on the world stage. And the need arose as a result of a shift, a paradigm shift in the viewing of disability issues as medical issues, from, from being medical issues to a human rights issue. And so there was a need then to have a crop of, of disability rights defenders who understood disability rights as a human rights issue. And so the master's program was initiated in 2008 um, with, with the aim, of course, of, of uh, equipping uh, disability rights defenders with knowledge on disability issues as a human right. So the program is offered by the Center for Human Rights in collaboration with the University of Pretoria's Department of Public Law. It is a two-year program which is offered in hybrid format with the bulk of the learning taking place virtually um, and the students also being required to attend block weeks in person in Pretoria. Center for Human Rights have also contributed to African scholarship by the supervision of quite a number of doctoral graduates who completed their studies here with us at the center. Here you see the Faculty of Law doctoral board indicating all the candidates over time that had graduated from the Faculty of Law. Around 90 of these uh, had been supervised within the center. The supervisors would have been Professor Heinz, to whom this board has also been dedicated, uh, Professor Marcus Kilander, Professor Michelle Ohan Sungule, Professor Charles Nguena, Professor Charles Fombat, and Danny Bradlow. The graduates, the doctoral graduates, have taken up positions and their voices 
are being heard as African scholars and they have taken up positions in academic um, institutions, for example, Makerere University, Kabarak University, University of Zimbabwe, often as the deans, teaching law in South Africa at Venda, University of Rhodes, University of Vipvatus Rand, and many others. They are also contributing greatly to scholarship through monographs and academic articles. Graduates also ended up with intergovernmental organizations. They are at uh, African Union institutions like the African Court, and they are um, with UN agencies such as Amnesty International, International IDEA. I should emphasize though that as far as the center graduates from our master's programs are concerned, there are many of them that also graduated from other institutions, not only with doctorates from the University of Pretoria, from the center. Over the years, the center was also privileged to nominate um, a number of very illustrious figures who accepted our nomination and were then awarded the honorary degree in law. And these honorary doctorates of the center include President, former President Nelson Mandela. It includes uh, Navi Pele, who was the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Chief Justice, former Chief Justice Chaskosin, and Mohammed, judges of the Constitutional Court, from the Stasen, Mokhoro, Zak Yakub, and others, practitioners like uh, George Bezos, and uh, academics such as Professor John Dugard. Most recently, also African scholars, Professor Yash Gai and Professor Sylvia Tamale. The center is really honored that these very important figures accepted our nomination and associate themselves then with what we do and for what we stand. Postdoctoral fellows also play an important role in the life of the center. We've had a few uh, postdoctoral fellows that assisted us. I'm thinking of uh, Romola Ariola, I'm thinking about Kera O'Connell, I'm thinking about Cristiano Dorsey. There are many, many more. They have been integral to the center. They've assisted us in so many ways, and uh, it's a part of the center that's also remembered fondly. Capacity building is one of the center's pillar strategies, and um, one of them because it, it is a tool with which we use to achieve the purposes of the center. And this is done through a, number, a variety of ways, including through um, short-term training, um, academic training, and uh, targeted training, such as trainings uh, you know, looking or targeted at government officials, um, as well as judiciary, so depending on the group, and as well as sometimes informed by instruments such as the Maputo Protocol work, during which we try to capacitate um, states and civil society organizations for building up uh, the respective, um, the, to, to present their respective mandate. As part of the capacity building and training initiative of the Center for Human Rights, I will speak specifically about the internship program for the alumni of the HRDA program. Um, basically, the aim of this program is to um, send our alumni to um, the African Court, the African Commission, and the Committee on the Rights of the Child to strengthen uh, the work that is done at these um, three um, organizations or institutions. The approach has been matching the skills of our alumni um, and their experience with the work that is done at, at these three organizations. Of course, uh, the work, uh, the internship program um, goes beyond just um, the court, the commission, and, um, and, the, and the committee. Um, over the years, um, the center has contributed a, lo a lot to institutions such as the University of the Gambia, um, ECOSOC, and PAP through this internship program. The work that the Democracy and Civic Engagement Unit does essentially spearheads the center's efforts to promote democracy and civic engagement. And we do that through um, facilitating formal mechanisms of engagement with uh, the Pan-African Parliament, 
and ECOSOC, which are essentially um, organs of the African Union that have been established to create space for citizens and civil society to interact and influence the workings of the African Union. Uh, the idea is to close the democratic gap that exists there. Over the years, we have done a really um, significant work with the permanent committees of the Pan-African Parliament, uh, particularly the Committee on Human Rights and Justice, uh, where we have facilitated various human rights trainings on um, you know, human rights issues, like um, the Maputo Protocol, for an example, um, human rights issues like uh, persons with albinism, particularly on the rights of persons with uh, living with disability. We have done significant work on, um, you know, the right of older persons, um, but also just generally um, training on African human rights system uh, to ensure that members of the Pan-African Parliament are able to perform um, their duty and assist the Pan-African Parliament to fulfill the mandate that has been given to them by the African Union. The Centre for Human Rights works to popularise, disseminate um, and educate the African population on a number of African human rights treaties. Um, the Women's Rights Unit within the Centre for Human Rights particularly focuses on disseminating and popularizing um, the Maputo Protocol. The Maputo Protocol was adopted by African governments um, as a protocol to the African Charter in recognition that African women require special protection um, owing to their... The Maputo Protocol was adopted by African governments in recognition of the reality that African women and girls operate in, live in, and experience violations in. It specifically speaks to um, the situation of African women that is peculiar to them in this continent as, as opposed to uh, the experiences of women in other parts of the world. The Women's Rights Unit has got a project that seeks to support um, African states and civil society organizations within these African states to utilize the Maputo Protocol in advancing the rights of women on the continent. This work entails training, advocacy, um, and providing technical support in the process of reporting on the realization of the rights contained in the Maputo Protocol. The training part of our state reporting project entails us engaging with member states directly and particularly with individuals who work in government who are responsible for collating information on the measures taken by the government to protect or realize women's rights in the country. Um, the aim of that engagement with member state uh, government officials is to create awareness um, on their obligations under the Maputo Protocol particularly what it means in practice for a government to be promoting, protecting and um, preventing violations of women's rights. In this way, we enable them to file um, relevant, to provide relevant information before the African Commission uh, as it plays its role in monitoring the, com the government's compliance with the obligations contained in the protocol. The aim of the Center for Human Rights uh, in building the capacity of various stakeholders including government officials, uh, personnel from NHRI, civil society, etc. Um, is again to equip uh, people who are already out there doing the work with the knowledge that they need to advance and fight for the rights of persons with disabilities. For instance, we've held capacity building workshops for CSOs um, or civil society organizations from, from all across Africa who are working on the rights of persons with albinism. And we train them on using human rights standards in order to uh, promote the rights of persons with albinism. 
Similarly, we've also done capacity building trainings for people that work in the criminal justice system, such as police officers, prosecutors, uh, magistrates, uh, on access to justice for persons with disabilities. So that involved um, capacitating these officials on how to ensure that persons with disabilities receive access to justice and participate in the justice systems on an equal basis with others. The MOOTS project under the Centre for Human Rights are one of the many initiatives that the Centre has used to further its aims as well as its purpose. We have the Nelson Mandela World Human Rights Mood Court Competition, which we hold annually for the five UN regions and law students from all of these re regions participate in this competition. On the other hand, we have the Christoph Haynes African Human Rights Mood Court Competition that, as by virtue of its name, is focused on the African region. The great work that is done by these competitions is bringing together law students from around the globe and giving them a platform to develop their legal study skills as well as an opportunity to learn more about human rights and pressing human rights matters. Another project that we have that we work on is the National Schools Mood Competition, which is also a great way to introduce the Bill of Rights as well as human rights education to high school students within South Africa. Recently, this project has expanded to countries such as Ethiopia, Ghana, and so many other countries where we are furthering constitutional education through the vehicle of Mood Courts. on the continent, the Center for Human Rights has observer status with the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, as well as uh, with the African Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of Children. The observer status that the Center for Human Rights has is important uh, for three reasons. Firstly, the, if you have observer status with the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, we are able to file cases at the African Court on Women and People's Rights. Without that observer status, the center would not be able to, to file cases with the African uh, Court on Women and People's Rights. Secondly, with that observer status, the African, uh, the Center for Human Rights is also able to make statements on a human rights situation on the continent uh, during the public session of the uh, commission. You also go to the African Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of Children. The center is also able to engage the committee, uh, including during private, the private session, and it also has access to any documents uh, that the committee might be developing, and also is able to uh, carry out maybe joint studies with the, both the committee as well as the, the, the commission on any human rights uh, situation. So that relationship is really important uh, for CHR uh, in terms of just the ability to collaborate and to do joint studies uh, and to engage uh, the two human rights mechanisms on human rights issues that affect the continent in general. Since 2012, the Center for Human Rights has been in a special consultative status with the United Nations Economic and Social Council. The importance of the consultative status is that it allows the center to participate in the activities of human rights mechanisms of the United Nations. For example, through the consultative status with the United Nations Economic and Social Council, the center has been able to participate in the sessions of the United Nations Human Rights Council by making oral interventions before the Human Rights Council. Some of the issues that the Center have raised before the Human Rights Council include the implementation of the Human Rights Committee decision in the case of Pasca Kabungulu versus Democratic Republic of Congo. Another issue that the Center has raised before the United Nations Human Rights Council is the situation of human rights in Ethiopia. The consultative status with the United Nations Economic and Social Council allows the Center to lend an African voice 
to human rights issues that are deliberated at the level of the United Nations. So the Center for Human Rights has quite a number of uh, units that focus on, on vulnerable groups, um, such as uh, the women's, women's Rights Unit, the Children's Rights Unit, uh, Migrant Rights uh, Unit, uh, we also have the SOGI Unit, um, and the unit that looks at uh, freedom of expression, elections and access to information, uh, just to name uh, a few of them. Um, the reason why the center focuses on vulnerable groups is because these are the groups that have been driven to the margins of society and in many cases uh, these vulnerable groups are forgotten and uh, many people really do not attend to their unique needs um, and um, as a result of which they continue to suffer uh, in, the, in their segregated uh, spaces. So really, I think the center made it the, a, a, a focus uh, of its work to say, look, we will be focusing on um, uh, vulnerable groups uh, to ensure that their rights are protected and we give uh, information to human rights mechanisms, but also more importantly, to duty bearers uh, in government um, so that they can address the challenges that uh, vulnerable groups on the continent uh, are facing and we do that through uh, a research capacity building as well as uh, advocacy uh, either as, as the Center for Human Rights but also uh, in partnership with uh, other NGOs around the continent. The ways in which the Center for Human Rights promotes, protects and uh, ensures uh, that there is respect for the rights of the most uh, marginalized and vulnerable communities in Africa is through the protection of the rights of sexual and gender minorities on the continent. So for this purpose, we have the SOGIESC unit in the center, which is tasked with advocacy, research, and training on all issues around the rights of LGBTIQ plus persons, generally in Africa, and with a specific focus also on South Africa. So in South Africa, we tend to do work around the promotion of the equality courts and the use of the equality courts by members of the LGBTIQ plus community. And around Africa, we tend to focus a lot on the uh, enhancement and the implementation of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights uh, resolutions on sexual and gender minorities, particularly Resolution 275, which is about ending violence and ending discrimination against uh, sexual and gender minorities on the continent. So the, lot, the work the center does also includes research, uh, generating evidence-based reports, and using this to train people to come to educate and to also influence policy makers on the continent. Um, the center also does training for different uh, categories of people, including people who are not yet uh, understanding of these issues through an annual short course, and also training for uh, experts or in a sense advocates on strategic litigation so that they also can be able to increase their capacity and help to develop uh, local advocacy and the uh, kind of changes we would like to see at the domestic levels. Students of the Masters in Human Rights in Africa program participate in Human Rights Clinic when they are doing the first semester at the University of Victoria. This is part of the experiential learning process that we adopt throughout the program. So they are placed with the different units of the Center for Human Rights where they work with different human rights mechanisms at the African Union level. For instance, students have prepared shadow reports to be presented to the African Commission. They have prepared cases that are submitted to the different human rights mechanism of the African Union by the Center for Human Rights. They work with different special rapporteurs and they are placed with the Pan-African Parliament and work with the Pan-African Parliament. The Human Rights Campaign um, advance human rights education as well as engagement amongst human rights stakeholders. Some of these campaigns include African Migrants Matter, Age with Rights, which focuses on the rights of elderly people. These campaigns are important because they speak to the people that find themselves at the peripheral of society, specifically older women, and because they are housed within the thematic research areas of the centre, the research we are able to put out 
continuously is able to speak to the growing challenges um, of these people who find themselves at the peripherals of our society. The Center for Human Rights runs a campaign and this campaign will be based on a selected theme. And in 2020 and 2021, the Center decided that its theme was going to be based on the intersection between technology and human rights and we called it Hashtag Tech for Rights. And this we are basically saying that the continent in Africa is embracing technologies just like everybody else in the world. And um, for us, the Center for Human Rights, the question then becomes, what, this, what does this mean for human rights? Why, how does it promote human rights? Or what are the risks that are associated with using technologies? And as the Expression Information and Digital Rights Unit, we took the lead and coordinated events at the Center for Human Rights and all the activities associated with technology and human rights. And these activities culminated with the Tech for Rights Expo. The idea behind the Tech for Right Expo was to bring together scholars uh, from across Africa as well as stakeholders to continue and build upon the discussions we're having around technology and human rights. We are alive to the reality that in Africa, we are grappling with a global digital divide and unfortunately, Africa is lagging behind other continents when it comes to the implementation of technology. But that aside, we still see the implications of technology in human rights and that is why we should be having this one of the outputs of the Expo is a digital uh, magazine that we will release, Open Access in 2022, where you will interact with the conversations as well as the outputs that we received um, from this Tech for Rights Expo. And I have to say that the success of this project could not have been done uh, but without the professionalism as well as the hard work and the camaraderie that is there in the Expression, Information and Digital Rights Unit. You. I think digital rights, the future of digital rights is the future of human rights. And the future of human rights is the future of everyone as a whole, the entire world. So the preservation of humanity, human sustenance. So when we're talking about the future of digital rights, not really diverse from our everyday survival, motive to survive. So, uh, but uh, in terms of future uh, prospects for digital rights, um, I, I envisage a future where we would have a more specialized aspect of digital rights. Um, for example, we might have to at some point have uh, specialized areas beyond the traditional aspects for, for example, uh, online expression, uh, privacy online, uh, women's rights online, into more specific aspects like uh, uh, emerging technologies and how do we ensure that human rights are also protected given this emerging technologies and we don't stifle innovation. I think that for me is one of the you know futures we can envisage for digital rights. But that also means that we require um, more specialized training, research, uh, advocacy, campaigns, uh, uh, and capacity building in order to be able to um, you know position uh, digital rights for you know uh, the future of you know uh, you know technologies and all that. Visual tools are very important in communicating the scope of the work that we do here at the Center for Human Rights by creating photo campaigns, photo books, graphic designs, posters, mini documentaries and other videos, we can show people exactly what it is that we're focusing on as well as communicating important information about what human rights norms are and how human rights challenges affect people across the continent. Uh, visual method of storytelling is important for a number of reasons. The first of which is um, that they are very formidable pedagogical tools. Um, several human rights is placed in such a way that it, it churns out experts and material that are some of the most pedagogical sources of human rights in academic and in practice on the continent. And churning out Similarly authoritative um, audio audiovisual tools, particularly at a time like this, when everything is going succinct and digital, is very, very important to complement the ongoing work of the sector. Also, uh, because um, storytelling is about power, 
Human rights advocacy is about power, um, and it's and that power is largely dependent on de de dependence on who gets to tell the story, who gets to capture, who gets to shoot, who gets to edit, um, who gets to archive. Charles photo exhibition. Um, that was, uh, I think, it was a compliment to the Iron Woman campaign. When Iron Woman campaign came out, um, it was just one queer woman, actually two queer women who were there, right? And uh, the no trans woman. And also it was in the heat of um, the question of are trans women women? Right? And if they are, would they have a place within the African human rights? So working on that, uh, going out um, to see trans women um, in Kauteng and in Northern Cape was very inspiring for me. Um, to see how they define their own womanhood journeys, you know, because they have to tell it to someone who is on the outside of womanhood. And working alongside other colleagues at the center as well. Um, well, it was very exciting. It was a learning curve for me, and I hope that we get to do more of that, more, more transgressive and exciting photo exhibitions. Talk is the Center for Human Rights podcast series, and in this podcast series, we offer insight into the state of human rights in Africa and the world at large. In our conversations, we engage with human rights activists, practitioners, and academics. You might be asking yourself, why is it important for an organization like the Center to have a podcast? What the podcast does is to help us as the Center to engage with different audiences, various stakeholders on relevant human rights research topics that we have. was the first case ever brought against South Africa to the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. I think South Africans would remember the case. It concerns a law student uh, who was uh, excluded from practicing law because the legal requirement of being a fit and proper person, the courts found, was not met because Mr. Prince insisted that he needed to use cannabis because he was a Rastafarian. So having exhausted local remedies, having gone to the Cape High Court and to the Constitutional Court, Mr. Prince found no remedy under South African law. So we at the Centre assisted Mr. Prince in preparing his case, submitting it to the African Commission. And before the African Commission, we argued that among other things, it was Mr. Prince's right to culture that was being violated. Because I think we have a long tradition of uh, cannabis being used in the African continent for very uh, spiritual reasons. For example, um, in, in, in uh, countries like Ethiopia. But, regrettably, the Commission did not find in Mr. Prince's failure. Sometimes you win even if you lose though. We know that subsequently, uh, having also given some exposure to the issue through this case being brought, the issue was you know, reflected upon over years and today we know the situation is, is uh, quite a bit different. I may add that we also brought this case to the UN Human Rights Committee, uh, um, also alleging basically a violation then in that case of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Again, it was not um, found in Mr. Prince's favor. But I think it was important to bring these cases to also create a greater sensitivity and awareness among population more broadly, but also government officials. So even though the case did not provide immediate relief, I think uh, there are important landmarks in uh, South Africa's engagement with the African human rights system. Before the African Committee on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, um, the committee that is charged to monitor the implementation of the African Children's Charter, the Centre has been involved in two decided cases. The first being the case involving the recruitment and use of children in the conflict in Northern Uganda, which was submitted by Professor Michelle Hanson Gulley as uh, part of the Centre's um, mitigation activities. And the essence of the case at the time was to you know, get the government of Uganda to 
do something about the lost resistance army and Joseph Kony's recruitment of children to fight in, on behalf of uh, his rebel movement in, in northern Uganda. And this was the first case that was decided by, that was submitted to the, the, the Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child. Um, quite unfortunately, by the time the case was decided, the, the war in northern Uganda had dissipated, so it was a bit moot at the time to, to seek implementation because the situation that necessitated the submission of, the, the, of this particular case had already been uh, dealt with at the time. But the centre has also been involved in the Talibis children case, which was jointly submitted with Torado, one of our partners in Senegal. The Talibis case involved child begging in Senegal. And the essence of the case was to protect the children of the rights of children. The essence of the case was to protect the rights of children who were begging on the streets. In this particular case, about an estimated 100,000 children who have been involved in child begging on the streets of Dakar, usually through the activities of uh, the Quranic masters. These children are usually sent to study Quranic lessons um, as part of their yeah, Islamic um, religious practices. And unfortunately, most of them end up on the streets because the Quranic masters were using them as a means of making money, um, sometimes to, to take care of the kids themselves, but usually as a means of the, the Quranic masters enriching themselves. And in this case, the committee actually decided that this practice of child begging deprived children of their right to survival and development, the right to education, to health care, and uh, the government of Senegal was ordered to you know, put measures in place to ensure that at a minimum there is a basic curriculum in these diaries and that the children are not forced to beg on the streets because it, it threatens their right to survival and, and development. Over the years, the centre has followed up with a committee jointly with RADO. The committee has held a implementation hearing to inquire from the government of Senegal on exactly what has been done to implement the decision. We have seen that some policies have been put in place. Some of the children were taken out of the streets, but unfortunately this is a recurring feature of, of a society that is quite religious and there's a bit of resistance towards the complete removal of, of the children from the streets because at present um, from information available to us the government has uh, put some policies in place and in you know, previous instances tried to remove the children from the streets even in the midst of uh, some resistance and there is also a encouraging reports that there are new diaries that are being designed to modernize the kind of uh, Quranic education that the kids um, receive in, in, in the diaries and our hope is that the full implementation of the decision will allow children to both enjoy their religious rights to receive Quranic education but also to be protected from exploitation and other kinds of uh, harmful practices that being on the streets exposes them to. The Executive Council directed the African Commission that it has to uh, undo the granting of observer status to the Coalition of African Lesbians. The Centre, together with the Coalition Cal, brought the case to the African Court. It was an advisory request. We wanted the advice of the Court whether the Executive Council essentially was competent to prescribe to the Commission whether the Commission can or cannot grant observer status on the basis of the African Charter. We argued that the competence of the Executive Council of the African Union was related to basically considering the report in front of it from the African Commission and then giving direction to the states about how to implement the, the decisions by the African Commission and not to second guess or to overrule on the substance of the African Charter, the African Commission. Regrettably, the African Court declined our request. So they never decided on the merits of the question we presented. They declined on the basis that the center lacked standing because in the jurisprudence of the court, an NGO such as ours was not entitled to bring a request, although we argued that we had the competence. Um, and on that basis, this request was never considered. It seemed to us that that request was perhaps not considered essentially because it was a very thorny political issue, which the court really uh, felt it had to sidestep. trying
to link our activism, our lobbying, our research to eventually contributions to scholarship, to publications. In this framework, we've set up the Pretoria University Law Press, which I think is quite unique in the sense that it is a university faculty and actually center-based publication house focusing on really contributing original research on human rights and democratization related issues. So the kind of research we try to do would also speak to these issues in a way that contributes to contemporary debates. We have conferences, we have colloquia, roundtables. Point is that these often lead to research and then publication. The Center for Human Rights publishes a wide range of, uh, of materials and, and documents, uh, starting first from Starting first with um, academic journals, uh, we have the African Human Rights uh, Journal. Uh, we also uh, have the African Human Rights Yearbook, the African Disability Rights uh, Yearbook. Uh, but also we have uh, a series of um, law reports. Uh, these law reports actually aim to to make uh, available to everyone, especially to the researchers the decisions and other software instruments that have been adopted by the African Commission uh, in the first place, but also the African Court of Human and People's Rights. So we have uh, the, the, the law report specifically uh, focusing on the decisions and uh, the aspects of the African Commission work, but also those related to the African, uh, uh, African Court of Human and People's Rights. We have, for example, the annual Disability Rights Conference, which uh, then in large part becomes the African Disability Rights Yearbook in a subsequent year. We have the African Human Rights Law Journal, which uh, takes on board uh, the themes that are important to us in the center, but also opens avenues for scholars from across Africa and the world to contribute on topics around African human rights. And um, we just celebrated 20 years of the existence, the uninterrupted publication of the African Human Rights Law Journal, which I think is is a feat in itself. Uh, because if one looks at the mainstream or the global or literature on human rights, uh, African the African human rights system is not really given the attention that it deserves. And, and the center has played that particular role to, to put this material uh, forward. And, and the other aspect of the center's work also is more like, you know, Africa evolves uh, within a a legal pluralism environment and uh, in a place where you have so many legal traditions. So the African uh, the Center for Human Rights tries to, to break the divide and the gap between the different uh, traditions, whether we talk about African uh, French speaking countries applying the civil law tradition, those applying the common law legal tradition by actually uh, not only translating or putting uh, available materials in French, in English, in Portuguese, but also bringing those scholars together in uh, books and journals such as African Human Rights Yearbook, so that at least people can start talking the same language when talking about the African uh, human rights uh, perspective. And the last aspect, which is important in terms of communication with the Center for Human Rights, is the fact that it gives um, the voice, it gives the place to uh, not only long-standing, but also emerging scholars who are ready to talk about uh, human rights issues from an African perspective. We also have a number of other conferences, such as the conference which started with a round table on African approaches to international law with a focus on human rights. And those papers, those presentations will soon come out in a book publication published by the Pretoria University Press. And so there are many, too many, many to mention. this UNESCO Prize for Human Rights Education. So it was really special in itself. Um, but the thing that stays with me, and I think one of the most important um, reasons why we were given this award, is that it recognized the fact that the center does not operate in isolation. 
that we have a set of partners in various concentric circles, depending on how big or small the program is, but a legion of human rights activists and professionals of institutions, uh, universities, all across the continent, without whom we would simply not be able to do the things that we do. for the Center for Human Rights would be around a place and about people. is that of an Africa where the rights of those who have been most marginalized, downtrodden, forgotten, neglected, but those rights are being focused upon and elevated and advanced and the center contributes and keeps on contributing towards that end. I think we've done that, but uh, we need to be contemporary in our thinking critical and uh, rethink continuously what is the most effective way of making the greatest possible impact. The second is an African Union human rights system that really works effectively towards the promotion and protection of the rights of all Africans. We know that the Centre has been working with the Court, the Commission, the Committee, increasing with the Pan-African Parliament and ECOSOC. We can keep building on those relationships, do more to, for example, submit cases, make requests for advisory opinions together with partners. But we should extend that to also speak to the more political, the African governance architecture, the African peer review mechanism that will work around a more holistic view of engaging and enhancing the impact that we as a centre can achieve. Center for Human Rights, uh, a happy 35th anniversary, and in my opinion, I see the center moving forward and growing with uh, growing units, such as the Children's Rights Unit, and of course, other units within the center. I just want to wish the center a very happy birthday. Uh, in 2021, the center turns 35 years old, and I've been here for 30 of those 35 years. Um, I started out when there were perhaps five of us and now at any given time there are probably 40 people that are here working on projects and programs of the centre. It's been an absolute joyride. I've thoroughly enjoyed every year that I've been here at the centre. Um, I've never felt like I didn't want to come to the office and um, I know that going forward, I certainly won't be here for the next 35, but I know that with the group of people that are here and that will come, a very dynamic group of young people who are passionate about what the centre does, that the centre will only go from strength to strength. And I wish everybody that's on, that stays on a very, all the very best for the next 35 years. I originally joined the Centre for Human Rights in 2020 after a very personal traumatic experience which occurred in my personal life. And I felt that, you know, I needed to do something more, not just for myself, but for the society. I felt like, you know, I had something to offer. And yeah, and so I joined the Center for Human Rights, specifically the Disability Rights Unit. And it's really helped me through a very rough time in my life. And I feel like, you know, there's so much of change that I can actually implement. And I hope to continue doing so. so genuinely feel at home and I feel like, you know, I'm growing in this space and like my opinions are heard. You know, not once have I actually been made to feel like I'm, I'm an intern. You know, I've always felt valued and respected and that's definitely a space that I see myself thriving in. And the center is just a place that I see growing from strength to strength, you know, with all of the net networks that we have, all of the projects, our academic programs, I only see the center going um, yeah, from strength to strength and I hope to grow along with it. Happy birthday to the uh, center, turning uh, 35, a uh, little bit uh, younger than myself and I haven't been at center for all the 35 years but quite many of them and I wish the center all the best for the next 35 years uh, and more. Uh, and going from strength to strength as it has done in the past 35 years. I wish the Center for Human Rights a fantastic 35th anniversary and the many more years of productively advancing our human rights education in Africa. 
they do say if you love your work you don't have to work a day in your life and i am i, I believe this axiom has become a life has become a reality because of of the colleagues that i have at the center for human rights i hope this is a culture that will be sustained um in the next 35 years to come the center really has a a bright future um i think uh, we this year we are celebrating 35 years of the center's work uh, and, and that's uh, such an important milestone to have, um, you know, continuously fought for human rights uh, for the uh, people of the continent. And um, with uh, its broad network of alumni that it has established over the years, the center really, you can say, is satellite offices, if you like, around the continent and, and really would want to uh, urge the alumni to work very closely with the center in terms of ensuring that uh, human rights uh, are realized um, in all the countries on the continent um, in terms of um, the human rights instruments that have been adopted by the African Union but also those that are relevant and, and have been adopted at the United Nations level. The code projects are both at a place where they are chartering new territories and in the next leg of their existence they are going to grow even bigger and better and bring across the globe so many more students and lives and impact the human rights community. And we owe all of this to the success of the Center for Human Rights. So to the Center for Human Rights, happy 35th anniversary and to so many more years. These 35 years, the Center has come a long way in, the, in ensuring the protection and realization of human rights in Africa. However, we are based in Pretoria with a few of satellite offices um, in other places in Africa. But in the next 35 years, I see the Center having an outreach in different countries across Africa so that we can say that we are there and we are making a change. The is known globally for its uh, impeccable contribution to um, human rights and democratization in Africa. And uh, while we've been privileged enough to have signed an MOU with the Pan-African Parliament, um, which then speaks to, you know, some sort of an establishment of formal mechanism of engagement with the Pan-African Parliament and civil society organizations. What I want to see in the future is um, a contribution by the civil society, the Pan-African Parliament Civil Society Forum and the Centre for Human Rights to contribute towards um, the Pan-African Parliament uh, policy formation processes um, to also contribute towards the development of modern laws um, and also enhance, continue to enhance the capacity of, uh, you know, permanent committees as, a, as an attempt, as I mentioned, to close this uh, existing democratic gap between civil society organizations and, and the Pan-African Parliament. The future that I see for the Centre in working in the women's rights space on the continent is one which highlights its strength in putting together member states of the African Union, civil society organizations working on women's rights on the ground, and national human rights institutes. There are many brilliant organizations, some big, some small, that are working on women's rights on the continent. Some engaging the, human, the African human rights system in one way or another, and some not even aware of the system or any of the protective measures that are available there. There is a gap in the connection between the various actors on the continent addressing women's rights and the centre is ideally placed as a connector of all of these, of all of these actors on women's rights and in this way we will be able to influence the way in which women's rights are realised on the continent and make it a reality uh, more than just what is contained in the treaty documents sitting in our offices. We would like to wish the Centre a happy 35th anniversary. That the Centre lies in the young people um, that the Centre is currently investing in, especially when they move into academia and advocacy roles uh, which play a huge part um, in the promotion of human rights on the continent. And the third is to have African scholars' voices, African scholarship, 
being increasingly made visible, being recognized, and being part and parcel of global debates around human rights and democracy issues. I think we can increase our footprint, among others, by creating, forging stronger South-South links global partnerships. So in summary, I think what we try to achieve, what I would like to see the center achieve in the next phase is uh, continuing building on what we've done, but creating avenues for greater impact, greater real effect on policy, legislation, and people's lives, and also to forge stronger, cultivate further relationships and create uh, energy that really impact collectively through these partnerships and through the work that we do as a center.